Hey, it's your friendly neighborhood immunologist, and today we're talking T cells. T cells are my favorite immune cell. They do amazing things like remember a pathogen for your entire lifetime. They can also tell B cells to make antibodies. They can help macrophages do their job better, and they are the number one cancer killing cell. So today I'm going to tell you what are T cells? What are the stages of T cell activation? How that creates memory T cells? and then tell you a little bit about what the functions of memory T cells are, as well as some of the factors that could contribute to them lasting either six months or potentially your entire lifetime. So let's get started. T cells belong to the category of the immune system called adaptive immune cells. That means that they can potentially remember something pathogenic for your entire lifetime. There's two different types, CD4 T cells and CD8 T cells. CD4 T cells are often called helper T cells whereas CD8 T cells are often called cytotoxic, meaning directly cell killing. They can destroy a cell that either has cancer or it's virally infected. Helper T cells mostly help macrophages do their job better. It helps them break apart and grab bacteria. It also helps B cells turn into plasma cells and crank out tons of antibody, particularly IgG antibody. All right, now I'm gonna remove the CD8 T cell and show you how a CD4 T cell gets activated. Here comes a macrophage. The macrophage has receptors that I've drawn on the outside, and if they bind perfectly with the CD4 T cell, it can become activated. So in blue is the T cell receptor, and it's binding to the macrophage's MHC class 2. That stands for Major Histocompatibility Complex 2. All that means is it's used to identify you and your tissue as belonging to you. That's where the histo comes from, it means tissue. So I'm drawing T cell receptor here, and then I'll draw MHC class two in the macrophage. So it's not alone. Basically signal one is in green and blue. So as long as the T cell receptor binds MHC class two with the presence of the CD4 co-receptor, that could potentially be activating only if the red signal is happening. That's the second part of the signal. If CD28 matches CD80, 86, it can become activated. Now I'll show you what happens with a CD8 T cell. Hopefully you're seeing a pattern here. It's going to interact with this macrophage, but it's going to actually bind to a different receptor. The CD8 T cell also has a T cell receptor in purple, and it's binding orange MHC class 1. Now MHC class 2 is only expressed on antigen presenting cells like macrophages, whereas MHC class one is basically your name tag. It's present on every cell in your body except for your red blood cells. So as long as the danger signal in red, CD28 and CD86 is there, you will have an activated T cell. All right, so here's the T cell cycle. You start off with a naive T cell. Naive T cell basically has never been activated on its T cell receptor. It's never found its match. So these types of T cells can live between eight and 15 years. And if you looked at any one tissue in your body, if you looked into one lymph node, you might have one between one and 100 matches for a particular pathogen. Now, when it finds its match, like I showed you previously with the macrophage, it takes about one to three days to do something called expansion. Expansion basically takes one T cell and could turn it into potentially 10 million T cells. That's incredible. That's why if you've ever had a cold and you've touched your lymph nodes, they were swollen and sort of hurt because one of your cells made practically 10 million copies of itself. Now the process going from a naive T cell to expansion can take approximately one to three days. Expansion can take between one to two weeks. And then lastly, there's the third phase called contraction. Contraction also takes between one to two weeks. And that's important because you lose approximately 90 to 95% of the T cells that were created due to the naive T cell activation. You don't want to keep all these T cells around. You really just want the memory. So the remaining cells after contraction are all memory T cells. So those five to 10% remaining. Now, this is what would happen the first time you get a particular cold. And it's entirely possible that you would get a cold a second time. 
sure if you have any kids in daycare, you completely understand. All right, so this is what happens either upon first receiving a vaccination or first receiving a cold. So the second expansion is going to be a much larger um, upswing here. I'm trying to do this on a particular scale, but you get the gist. All right. So the second expansion is going to be on the scale considerably more creation of T cells than the first time. This is why vaccines are often given on multiple doses, typically spaced out over months to years. And you can see here, as we reach the peak of the second expansion, there's also going to be a second contraction. And all the remaining memory T cells here, you can see I intentionally left the, um, I want to call it a swoop, but basically the curve is higher here under the second contraction because you would have more memory T cells created after second exposure to the pathogen or vaccination. All right, so how do T cells make clones of themselves? They can do it themselves by making a protein called a cytokine. Now the cytokine that helps T cells make clones is called IL-2. I'm drawing them as circles here. IL is abbreviated for interleukin, literally means between two white blood cells. So it can act on nearby cells, which is paracrine, or it can act on itself, which is called autocrine. So I'm drawing the autocrine activation right here, and then this T cell, the IL-2, can bind to the IL-2 receptor, and this T cell can make a clone. And you might be familiar with IL-2 if you know anyone who's had cancer. This is actually used to boost all T cell function and fight off cancer. All right, so here's the wrap up for T cell memory. They're basically the T cells that survived contraction after an antigen was discovered. They are long lived clones. They can live between 30 and 160 days. So the T cell receptor is basically preserved. So even though each T cell might only live for a couple of months, they've made copies of themselves that live for a couple of months. And this can continue for your entire lifetime as long as there's enough IL-2. So I showed you before the cytokine IL-2 binding to the IL-2 receptor. And that basically allows it to sort of make infinite clones. Now, on top of that, there are two different types of memory cells I'd like to tell you about. One is called the T effector cell, and the other is called the T uh, central cell. So the T effector is abbreviated TEM, and the central is abbreviated TCM. Basically, the effector cells can live in your tissue. Scientists identify them by receptors on their surface, CD62 low and CCR7 low. The T central memory, they are located at your lymph node, and they're actually expressing the same receptors high. So if the receptors are low, they're targeted to your tissues. If the receptors are high, they're targeted to your lymph nodes. So T cell memory is really why we are not permanently sick all the time, because most every pathogen you've encountered since you were a child has been remembered and preserved by T cell memory in your body as they continue to use IL-2 to make clones of themselves. This has implications for all sorts of things, but the reason I did this video is uh, because of somebody in the comments section on one of my videos asked me to look into a claim that AstraZeneca said that their vaccine would have greater memory response, T cell memory response, than the others. So, in addition to getting a chance to talk about T cells, this is a bit of a primer to talk a little bit about vaccines and memory responses. All right, hope you found this helpful, and until next time.